a good day. A good day. This is Mark Marin C. Magbo. And today, we'll be discussing a research on crossing PBDF membranes for extreme separations. So what are, what are our learning objectives for today? First is to understand the industrial significance of solvent-resistant nanofiltration membranes and their robustness and extreme conditions. Second, we want to achieve just a general overview of the research objectives, methodology, and findings. And third, we want to appreciate Barge's chemical engineering principles as focused on the discussion of selected results. So, what is the background for our research? There's a case of waste solvents. So, 80% to 90% of material costs for pharmaceutical industries are solvents used in the process. For example, for around the there is 25 to 100 kilograms of solvent used per kilogram of the actual pharmaceutical product. And this constitutes to 70% of the waste stream that is produced by pharmaceutical industries. So definitely there is a case of waste solvent. And what does green chemistry propose for this problem? Green chemistry show, tells us that we need to replace these solvents with a cleaner alternative, with these cleaner solvents. However, these are not uh, generally or directly or straightforwardly possible as there is not, you cannot just replace solvents in certain processes. And in that way, a more economical and more feasible and more engineered way of um, application would be just to employ sustainable solvent use in this way that we apply technology in the process so that the process actually employs lesser amount of solvent. And, and in this application, there is a membrane technology that would be very, very much um, useful, which is the solvent-resistant nanofiltration. Since solvent-resistant nanofiltration allows for solvent recovery and also it allows for solvent recycling. Thus, it provides the avenue for the sustainable solvent use. And this solvent-resistant nanofiltration has found has already found applications in biotechnologies, in the food and bioproducts, especially in vegetable oil production, biorefinery for the biodiesel production, in the pharmaceuticals industry, the bulk chemicals industry, in the catalysis, uh, catalyzed reactions, and also in the petrochemicals industry. However, in order to further the applications of membranes into the solvent-resistant nanofiltration in the actual industrial scale, in the actual industrial scenario, we need to search for robust membranes. What are robust membranes? These are membranes that are able to maintain their performance in those conditions, in those harsh conditions, which they are able to remain st stable, they have high stability, even at the presence of the solvent, or even at high temperatures or presence of high acids or bases, and that these membranes are generally or typically easier to prepare. They are not complex to prepare. And in this way, there is a good research that arose which uh, used uh, PVDF, cross-linked them, and employed them for solvent-resistant nanofiltration. So these PVDF, cross-linked PVDF membranes, they've showed good nanofiltration performance. They are able to initially show some, some stability in the solvent and extreme pH, and they are relatively easy or straightforward to prepare. There's not much top uh, modifications that you need to do. And, ha and in this way, we are able to see that currently, these cross-linked PVDF membranes have a problem. The cross-linking process in this uh, production of these membranes is quite con time-consuming. And also, the cross-linker 
that is used for this membrane, which is the silene diamine or XDA, is quite expensive. And in this re and for these reasons, there is a challenge for upscaling the process. And thus we propose some solution to this process, which is to have a one pot cross-linking method. We look for a cheaper alternative cross-linker, which is HDA or hexamethylenediamine, and then we can evaluate the resistance of the membranes that we produced in solvent environment, in extreme pH, and as well as high temperature. So what are the advantages of robust membranes? So robust membranes in industrial settings, they have there several industrial advantages. For example, in extreme pH, which is a harsh condition for most membranes, because uh, extreme pH where membranes are lower than 4 or higher than 11. So lower than 4 is acidic, higher than 11 is basic. When a membrane can withstand extreme pH, when it's robust, it can allow direct treatment of highly acidic or alkaline streams. It can also be resistant to the cleaning, membrane cleaning materials, cleaning chemicals, and thus it can provide longer membrane life. So a membrane that is robust to extreme pH could have these benefits. On the other hand, a membrane which is uh, resistant to high temperatures and for a membrane process or a membrane, the high temperature is temperatures beyond 50 degrees Celsius. So if it goes beyond 50, it's already high for a membrane. So if a membrane process is robust enough to be operating at high temperature, then it will allow heat recovery since you won't need to cool down or heat that you need to cool down the, the process stream in order to use a membrane process. Thus, you will, lose, you will use less heat exchangers. You can also have flux increase or you can think of it as lower operating pressure for the process since it's operating high temperature. So it's, uh, the resistance to flow is less. And also it can be used for in situ thermal sanitation for example, especially for membrane processes which are used in food applications or um, biotechnology applications. So this is very essential as you can actually sanitize the membranes with high temperature since they are resistant to it. Resistant to it. So these are the advantages of developing these robust membranes that we are talking earlier. So the research has two main objectives. First is to optimize the new method of cross-linking of polyvinylidine difluoride or PVDF membranes with hexamethylenediamine or HDA. That's the first objective. And the second objective, main objective, is to employ the cross-link PVDF membranes for extreme pH and high temperature solvent-resistant nanofiltration. So with these two objectives, we are going to discuss the specific methodology for the optimization of cross-linking. We start with the preparation of the membrane or the PVDF membrane. Once we are able to prepare the PVDF membrane, the nanofiltration membrane, we are cross-linking it with HDA at different cross-linking time. After cross-linking, we are able to obtain the cross-link PVDF. And in this cross-link PVDF, we are modifying this one by adding a top layer. And in this modification, we are using three polymers, the polyamine, polyamide, and polyvinyl norbornin or PBNP. So when we have applied this top layer to the cross-link PVDF, we have this um, modified membrane. And then we will characterize this modified membrane via microscopy and spectroscopy as well as swelling tests. On the other hand, on the second objective, on extreme pH and high temperature solvent resistant nanofiltration, we will start with extreme pH nanofiltration. We'll employ five molars of hydrochloric acid and five molars of sodium hydroxide in five day, five day immersion in this uh, acidic or alkaline solution and then we will do filtration. Uh, we, we, 
we did filtration um, of dyes of sucrose and salts using these membranes after the extreme pH filter, uh, treatment. And then it's followed by a high temperature solvent resistant nanofiltration uh, at temperatures from room temperature up to 90 degrees Celsius, not ex not not ex not not going uh, higher or further than the boiling point of the uh, of the solvents that we are using or we have used. So in this part, we used ethanol, acetonitrile, and heptane as the solvents for the high temperature resistant nanofiltration. And then we use several dyes in order with the different molecular size in order to test their their uh, performance in these high temperature conditions. And after that high temperature solvent resistant nanofiltration, we will then characterize the membranes. So whether there are changes in the membranes after this treatment or filtration, we will look into the microscopy and spectroscopy of this membranes and then determine or benchmark their performance and after that we uh, we did a simulated purification or some sort of applications of these uh, membranes by separation of model dyes so we use two dyes at high temperature and then we are able to separate them so going to the results in discussion so in the cross-linking mechanism for the PVDF must be clear in order to understand the research. So there's two steps in the cross-linking process. First is that the polymer is first dehydrofluorinated. So this is the first step, the dehydrofluorination process. And after the dehydrofluorination process, then the cross-linking process will be possible. So only if the polymers or PVDF are dehydrofluorinated is when you are able to cross-link them. So this is consecutive process. So the first thing that we checked in the optimization of cross-linking is that we checked did the cross-linking happen. So as we observe from the actual membrane, they have a change in color after the cross-linking. So from this white membrane, it turns into this black membrane. And to be sure, we looked into the spectroscopic data. So we look into the IR spectra of the membranes as you increase their cross-linking time. And as you increase the cross-linking time, there is the rise of a new peak in the IR spectra. And in this peak corresponds to the dehydrofluorination and cross-linking uh, chemistry that is imparted into the membrane. And to be sure, we look into the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy data of the membrane as you cross-link them, them, as you cross-link them over time. And we can see that the general amount of fluorine in the membrane decreases. And this is because of the dehydrofluorination. And, and then there's an increase in the nitrogen content in the membrane, which is due to the uh, cross-linking by the diamine or the HDA uh, cross-linker. So, and in this way, we are able to ensure that, yes, cross-linking, did it, it really happened. So, how did the cross-linking affect the membrane? So, there is some slight decrease in the crystallinity of the membrane as we looked into it in the X-ray uh, diffraction spectroscopy. So there is some slight change in crystallinity. It might affect the uh, the mechanical properties of the membrane. And and the good thing is that as we increase the cross-linking time, the stability of the membrane in the solvent also increases, which is good. And is there any change in the filtration performance of the membrane? So after cross-linking, there is some change. Yes, the permeance of the membrane is half, but the rejection or the retention of the dye 
and the sucrose are consistent. So it is generally good since the rejection or the retention is good, is consistent, although the permeance decreased. And as we look into the scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope images of the membrane, we are not able to observe any top layer densification, which is good for a cost thinking process. So chemical engineering in focus, what exactly is permeance? So I was talking about permeance earlier and permeance here has the unit of liters per meter squared per R bar. So what exactly is permeance? So let's do some basic unit analysis. So the permeance case of P was expressed in terms of LMH bar or as in liters per meter squared per R per bar, which we can express in a way as liters per R per meter squared per bar. And thus, we can understand it in physical terms as volumetric rate per area per pressure. Then as we note that the flux, as we discussed in the transport phenomena discussion, is, is equal to the rate per area. Thus, the permeance is equal to the flux per uh, differential pressure or pressure since it is also proportional to this expression even if you multiply it with the thickness of the membrane or delta x so you will have case of p or permeance is directly proportional to the flux times the membrane thickness over the pressure difference and then you may rearrange this expression so that you are able to obtain that the flux is directly proportional to the permeance multiplied by the membrane pressure difference or gradient over the membrane thickness. And then as we know that the flux is proportional to the driving force over resistance which you can see as the driving force would be the pressure difference and the resistance would be the membrane thickness, then we can understand permeance or case of P as some sort of mass transfer coefficient. So in that way, we can understand that the permeance is a way of uh, evaluating the permeability of the membrane. So how do we calculate the retention now? So we calculate the retention in the membrane process by doing some simple mass balance. So first we let F go to feed R's retentate and P is permeate. And then we assume constant density for the system. So we perform overall mass balance. So, uh, the volume of feed is equal to the volume of retentate plus the volume of permeate. Then the solute mass balance. So we multiply the concentration of the solute in the feed to the volume of the feed. And then it is equal to the concentration of the solute in the retentate times the volume of the retentate plus the concentration of the solute in the permeate times the volume of permeate. So we know that the retention is the amount of solute in the retentate over the amount of solute in the feed. Thus we obtain this expression. So using this expression, we can express the solute mass balance in this manner when we divide both sides with this expression. And thus, if we rearrange it and we change this expression into the retention, R, then we are able to obtain that the retention is equal to 1 minus the concentration in feed over the concentration of a concentration in the permeate over the concentration in feed times the volume of permeate over the volume of feed. And then we perform another assumption. As chemical engineer, we have a lot of assumption. And then we assume negligible retentate volume so that the volume permeate is almost equal to the volume of feed and thus 
the equation for the for the calculation of the retention is equal to 1 minus the concentration of permeate divided by the concentration of feed. So we are able to obtain retention for the equation for retention using mass balance. Chemical engineering, very useful. Now, going back to the research, so the, we now look into the crosslinker or the HDA, the amine crosslinker. Can the crosslinker be recycled? Uh, we perform several recycling experiments and we see that the, the, the diamine did not degrade since we didn't observe any degradation products in its nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And as we looked into its cross-linking capacity, we are able to see that the amount of fluorine and nitrogen imparted into the membrane or removed in the membrane are not so much different as you have different cycles, as you increase the cycles of cross-linking. So, we can see that the cross-linking is recyclable. The cross-linker is recyclable. Sorry. So, is the new cross-linking method better than the old method? So, as we see, there are similar effects in the retention and stability of the membrane. But we are able to see that the new method is more economical because of the cheaper cross-linker, the less components, and recyclable Crosslinker. So, how do we infer process economics? Chemical engineering in focus again. So, let's do a quick upscale projection for capex and opex. So, what is capex? Capex are the capital capital expenditures, and while opex is operating expenditures, you will encounter most of these uh, concepts when you go into the plant design or equipment design. So, we consider some quick upscale so this is uh, this is just a qualitative analysis and not a quantitative analysis so this is order in order to have a theoretical idea uh, a theoretical explanation of uh, whether the process is actually more economical compared to another process so we consider the number of steps in the process the number of components employed in the process the reaction kinetics in the process operating conditions, the material cost, and whether recycling is possible. So, there are the same number of steps for the old and the new process. And as a rule of thumb, for every step, there is a new equipment added. So, they're the same, so they have the same scoring. For the number of components, the new process has two components, whereas the old process, they have four components, they have more components. So, as a rule of thumb, when there is more components in a process or a process stream, then it intensifies the process requirements. Everything in the process is intensified. Thus, you will have bigger capital expenditures and also bigger operating expenditures. So, equipment and piping are major capex, capital expenditures contributor. Thus, since your process is more intensified because it has more components, then it means you will have more storage tanks, it will have more pumps, you will have more piping, and thus you will have more capex for the old process as compared to the new process, which have low number or lesser number of components. If you look into the reaction kinetics, the new process has faster reaction kinetics. So, if you have a faster reaction kinetics, it will give you smaller reactor and also shorter operation time. Thus, the smaller reactor would be corresponding to a smaller capital expenditure for the new process. And the shorter operation will be a smaller uh, operational operating expenditure for the process because you will reduce the operating expenses from the overhead cost or the electricity and other stuff that you are um, that you are gaining cost from due to operating for a longer time. So reaction kinetics. And then we consider the operating condition. The new process is operating at 60 degrees Celsius, which is 
quite high while the old process is operating at room temperature so there's a disadvantage in this one in this one as a rule of thumb additional heating and pressurization will give you more cost for the capital expenditure for the heating utilities for the heating equipments and also operating expenditures for the heating fuels and all the costs from heating so generally operating at room temperature is more economical for most processes if possible and then we consider the material costs for the new process is only 71 euros while the old process is 228 euros per kilogram as we know the raw material as a rule of thumb in most cases is the major operating expenditure contributor thus it will be in intensify higher up uh, the higher cost for the old process is intensifying the operating expenditures for this process or the OPEX and then recycling is possible for the new process and thus as a rule of thumb it will result in lesser material use and also lesser waste so less risk to treat and that's the operating expenditures for a process without recycling as you could expect would be higher and thus with this uh, theoretical or uh, qualitative um, qualitative deductions we are able to obtain some capex opex score for the new process and old process the new process would have a lower capex opex score and thus you can say somehow that the new process is more economical considering all the upscale projection of the process for capex and opex so this is one way of inferring or hitting deductions whether a chemical process or a specific process is more economical than another process so we use some process economics so um, continuing whether the in the discussion of whether the new cross-linking is better than the old one it is relatively faster the new cross-linking is relatively faster around 70 times faster so and also it's more selective for cross-linking so we can discuss what is behind the faster kinetics in the new cross-linking process it's still chemical engineering and focus so let's do a quick review on reaction engineering so first let's write down the generalized individual reaction steps so we have the PVDF reacting with the base and then you'll have the um, dehydrofluorinated PVDF and some HF and then this dehydrofluorinated PVDF reacts with the A mine cross linker and you obtain the cross link PVDF the hydrogen fluoride produced in the dehydrofluorination then reacts with the magnesium oxide catalysts and then produces the magnesium fluoride salt and this is a very uh, very favored reaction thus the magnesium oxide serves as a catalyst now we have written the individual reaction steps we will now clarify assumptions so we assume that the the reactions are forward um, there's no equilibrium reactions and then the ac the catalyst magnesium oxide is provided in excess and then in the old and new process the amine works in the similar mechanisms and then we write down the pseudo reaction rate equations so we produce the rate equations for the uh, the hydrofluorination process this is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the PVDF raised to the exponent alpha multiplied by the concentration of the base raised to the exponent beta. And then the rate equation for the cross linking would be a rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the, uh, the hydrofluorinated PVDF raised to gamma and the concentration of the A mine raised to. Um, delta so 
Remember, our assumption is that forward reactions are the only ones happening. So we obtain this pseudo reaction rate equations. And then the next step is we employ Arrhenius equation for temperature effects. We will use these Arrhenius equations in order to account for the effects of temperature on the reaction rate constant. So Arrhenius equation is very useful in several chemical engineering uh, applications, specifically in the reaction engineering uh, aspects. Now, it seems that it's, an, it seems that it's a not-so-quick preview on reaction engineering since we have more steps to follow. And the fifth step is the hardest one. Remember organic chemistry. You need to remember the mechanisms of eliminations and substitution reactions, specifically E2 and SN2 reactions. And then we indicate the effects of vase that we use for the processes, for the two different processes, the effects of solvent and the temperature on the rate equation. So this is the old, the new process, and this is the old process. So for the new process, there are specific increase in temperature, which increases the rate constants. And in the new process, there is an uh, increase of the concentration of the amine. For the old process, there is the effects of the solvent that they use, which effectively reduce the activation energy, which increase the rate constant for the dehydrofurnation, and also there is higher concentration of base for the old process. Now, we establish the rate determining step, and then this is based again with your organic chemistry, and we knew that the rate determining step would be the cross-linking since this is highly unfavored reaction as compared to the dehydrofluorination reaction. And then we compare the rates of the new and old process and we are able to have deduced judgment that the, old, that the new process could be slower or faster or equally or have the same uh, rate as the old process for the dehydrofurnation. Whereas for the rate determining step, for the cross-linking, it would be faster. It would be faster for the new process than the old process. So this explains both the faster cross-linking, uh, faster cross-linking that is happening for the new process as compared to the old process, as well as the selectivity towards cross-linking than the hydrofluorination for the new process. It is because of the effects of temperature and also the higher amine concentrations, effective amine concentration for the new process. So using reaction engineering concepts, we are able to explain um, how um, the faster kinetics for the new process is able to be uh, the result of the conditions in the cross-linking process. Now moving forward to the moving back to the results of the research. So now that we have you are able to cross-link the membranes, can we further modify these cross-link PBDF membranes? And yes, we are able to further modify these membranes as we are able to prepare uh, top layer modifications for these membranes. We are able to prepare a polyamine TFC membrane, a polyvinylenorbornin TFC membrane, and a polyamide TFC membrane for this crossing PVDF membrane. So we now have uh, modified membranes that we are, we are able to produce modified membranes based on this crossing PVDF membranes. And moving forward to the next objectives of the research, we must remember that these membranes are nanofiltration membranes. And as we are able to remember, nanofiltration membranes uh, employs both porous and dense membranes. So, specifically, these cross-link PBDF membranes are a combined porous and dense membrane. So, they have a porous parts and dense skin layer. So, they are a combination of porous and dense uh, structures. So, how did the extreme pH affect these membranes? So 
since we tested them extreme pH, we looked them we look at them after the treatment under the uh, scanning electron microscope or SEM, and then we're able to see that there's some increase in porosity after uh, base treatment and some slightly rougher topography on the membranes that we that are exposed to extreme pH. However, when we looked into the IR spectra in order to determine whether there are significant um, chemical changes in the membrane, we are able to observe some minor changes, some nominal dehydrogenation, and some minor changes in the top layer for the other modified membranes or TFC's membranes. And is there any change in the filtration performance after the pH treatment or after the ha acidic and basic treatment? As we can see, the retention and retention of these membranes are consistent. They are, didn't change after the uh, acid, acid or base treatment. But we can also see that the permeance increase after the uh, these treatments. So the permeance increase, the permeability increase, but the selectivity is consistent, which is good. And we it's highly desirable. Now moving to the results of the high temperature treatment, how did the high temperature solvent affect the membrane? So we looked again under the microscope to see if there's any changes in the structural structures of this structural um, compositions of these membranes and we are able to see that there's no compaction of macrovoids in these membranes and there's no significant change in these membranes after the high temperature treatment. And as we looked into the chemistry of these membranes under the IR spectra, there's no significant difference and there's no degradation that is observed. Are their performance changed permanently after the treatment in high temperature? In some cases of the solvent, there is a permanent change and there is a in big increase in the permeance, which is desirable. And this is also explained in some other researches. Did their performance vary with temperature? So did the performance of the, fil the membrane filters, the costing PVDF membranes change as you increase the temperature? As you can see, using different solvents, water in black, um, blue, uh, ethanol in blue, acetonitol in red, and heftane in green, you can see that generally, the permeance of the membranes, costly equivalent membranes, increased and the, uh, and the retention is consistent as you increase temperature. So, did the performance vary? They vary in terms of permeance. And we can also observe here that, sorry, there is some unexpected behavior, anomaly, anomalous, anomalously looking behavior for water and also for acetonitrile. It seems to go down, the permeance seems to go down and seems to plateau for water and for ACN it seems to go down. So as we observe, observe in the trends for the variation of permeance with temperature. In general, we can see that the permeance increases with temperature, but in water, there's some kind of plateau, permeance plateau behavior. And for ACN, there's a drop. And as observed for ethanol and heptane, there's high increase on permeance per unit temperature. So we already discussed that earlier. So, what is behind this variation with temperature? Again, as chemical engineer, we can explain it very, very easily. So, we review the transport phenomena of membrane separation, chemical engineering focus. So, we have to note again, again, we note nanofiltration membranes have both porous and dense structure. Thus, 
both for flow model and solution diffusion model applies to these membranes. So we will apply Darcy's law for viscous convection and Fick's law for molecular diffusion. So viscous effects or the effects of viscosity. So we looked in how viscosity varies with temperature for these different solvents. And then we can see that the viscosity for these solvents decreases as you increase the temperature. So the decrease in viscosity, there's a decrease in viscosity with increasing temperature. And then as we observe for the water, there is as you increase your temperature, there is less, less decrease in viscosity. As you can note, from 25 to 50 degrees Celsius, that the change in viscosity is big. But if you move from 75 to 100 degrees Celsius, the change in viscosity is very low, very small, or it's almost insignificant. Now, for the diffusion, composite, diffusion component of the transport, we will use the Stokes-Einstein equation to estimate for the diffusivity. So based on this equation, there is an increase in diffusivity if you increase the temperature. And also, if you decrease the viscosity, there is an increase in diffusivity. So with this in mind, we can see that as we increase temperature, we decrease the viscosity. And as we, decrease, as we increase temperature and decrease viscosity, we increase the diffusivity. And based from these two transport models, as we decrease the viscosity, we increase the viscous convective transport or flux. And as we increase the diffusivity, we increase the molecular diffusive transport or the diffusive flux. And thus, Combining both of these mass, uh, both of these mass transport phenomena, we can say that the increase in temperature definitely would increase the flux or permeans through these membranes. So that is how we explain the the transport the variation due to the temperature using transport phenomena. So moving forward, moving back to the results of the, the research, we did other properties affect the permeance. We look into other properties. And then performing Arrhenius plots, we are able to see corrected feed viscosity, meaning we remove the effects of viscosity uh, in the data. And we are able to see that there's still changes that is occurring in the permeance that is not attributable to viscosity thus non-viscous effects are present and then we look into the solvent properties for these non-viscous effects and we saw that the effect of solvent to the swelling of the membrane is might be significant as they have they form a linear fit with the effects to the Permian. So, the effect of swelling of the sol of the membrane with the solvent is significant. So it has direct effect on the permeance as you increase temperature. So what do this tell about the solvent transport? So it only tells to simplify these words is that in one of the membrane, the one that is not modified which is more porous, the transport phenomena can be modeled more for a pore flow model. Whereas on the other hand, for the modified membrane, the one with a different top layer with a different polymer, it is more of a solution diffusion model since this is more of a dense structure. So this tells us how solvent transport through the membrane uh, based on the 
transport phenomena and the permeance values from the experiments. So now we're looking to compare these membranes that we made with the commercial membranes. And then we are able to see that these membranes can effectively um, retain particles or molecules we'd have uh, bigger than 586 daltons or grams per mole so molecules that are bigger than this uh, value can be retained by these membranes and as we compare them using uh, a retention versus permeance uh, retention versus permeance chart which you can see the selectivity versus permeability paradox we are able to see that the membranes that we made the these membranes are superior than the current uh, commercially available membranes they are superior or comparable or almost the same performance so which is good since these membranes can also withstand extreme pH and high temperatures and many solvents. So can they really separate for pharmaceuticals? So in order to uh, determine whether these membranes can separate for pharmaceuticals, separating uh, the active ingredient from the uh, toxic impurities, we perform simulations using model dyes. So we separate uh, acid fixin from acidin orange. So the feed looks like this red uh, color, while the permit has this clear yellow color. And we are able to see that at different temperatures, the retention are almost the same. But for the the smaller solute, the retention is decreasing with increasing temperature. Uh, the theory is that the pores increase in size as you increase temperature. So that would have some effects on the retention. And from this, we are able to theoretically um, compare what would be the optimal, uh, optimal conditions for uh, purification of the pharmaceutical ingredient and we obtained that to be at 50 degrees celsius so the optimal um, diafiltration process can be obtained using the cross link PBDF membranes at 50 degrees celsius so that will be the end of the research of the uh, research results and we are going to summarize what we have discussed so for the learning summary, solvent resistant nanofiltration membranes are essential to solvent recovery and recycling applications in many industries. So their robustness in extreme conditions provides several unique advantages. Second, the research optimized the cross-linking of PBDF membranes and employed these cross-link membranes for extreme pH and high temperature solvent resistant nanofiltration. This faster and more economical cross-linking method produced cross-link PBDF membranes which were proven viable for extreme separations. And also lastly, the CHEP or the chemical engineering principles of mass balance, reaction engineering, and transport phenomena were highlighted to be very much useful in the research especially in explaining physical processes. So if you want some further reading, you can read the research or other uh, reviews on solvent-resistant nanofiltration. Thank you for listening, and I hope you are able to appreciate uh, the current some current research into the membrane technology, which could change how we... Uh, use membranes in the industrial processes. So actually employing membranes for solvents and not only water. Thank you.